Hello everybody, my name is V is for victim, and welcome to the very start of my YouTube channel. Honestly this is my first time making something like this, so I appreciate any feedback or tips. But I've wanted to do something for a while now that sort of combines my passions for true crime and art. So this series is going to be called Drawn to Death, where I will mostly be discussing, as I mentioned, true crime, all while giving some fun visuals. You should be able to enjoy the content by just listening to it like a podcast, if you prefer. I hope I picked a very appropriate model for our first subject, which is the fascinating Ursabit Bathory. Many people may have a vague idea of her, if you ever have seen the popular iconic image of a woman bathing in the blood of virgins. Her story is sort of the origin of that myth. Though, what is true and what is built up from rumor, we'll be diving into, as we look at the most prolific female serial killer in recorded history. Ursabit Bathory, known by the English pronunciation Elizabeth Bathory, was born in the year 1560 on the Bathory family estate, to her mother Anna and her father George Bathory. As it is with the early lives of children in these years, the records are pretty sparse on the details of this time. But to get an idea of just what kind of family we're talking about here, Ursabit's uncle was Stephen Bathory, who was king of Poland and a prince of Transylvania. They were extremely wealthy, and one of the most respectable families in Hungary. What you might consider surprising for the time is that this was a, theologically speaking, loose time in Hungary. While Ursabit was raised Calvinist Protestant, her mother came from the Roman Catholic family, and there were books from various theologians readily available to her household. This sort of coexistence wouldn't be a constant in her lifetime, as we'll see later. As a child, Ursabit was known to have suffered seizures, but was otherwise an active girl. She learned several languages, including Hungarian, Greek, German, and Latin. As a child she was known to be tomboyish, and doing whatever she pleased with minimal supervision. It seems she was a well-loved child for an era when nobility tended to pass their young off to a wet nurse and only see them on occasion. At the age of 10 years old, Ursabit was engaged to the 14-year-old Ferenc Nadesti. The two were opposites in several ways. Ursabit was well-educated and learned, while Ferenc was functionally illiterate. He had always been fascinated with war and warfare, and knew in his heart his destiny was to be a soldier. As it was, his family was on shaky ground, as his father switched his allegiance between the Habsburgs and the King of Hungary multiple times. He finally hedged his bets with Archduke Ferdinand, which was likely the wisest move. The Holy Roman Empire would be a constant thorn in the side of Hungarian politicians for many years to come, however. At any rate, it is important to note that this was, in fact, a step up for the Nadastis, to marry into the illustrious Bathory family. But things weren't so simple, at least not according to rumor. Supposedly, at around age 13, young Ursabit fell in love, had an affair, and even bore a child from this encounter. It is speculated in some accounts that the father of her love child was executed by a jealous Ferenc Nadesti shortly after. The child was said to have been given to a woman to spirit away to Wallachia, who was paid well for her discretion. This is one of the first of many rumors surrounding Ursabit's life. Given that this one was recorded long after her death, there is a considerable amount of doubt cast upon it, so we can take this rumor with a grain of salt. At the age of 15, Ursabit was at last wed to her fiancé with the grand ceremony typical of the time. The wedding drew over 4,000 guests, and many on the invitation list were nothing to sneeze at. Archduke Ferdinand of the Habsburgs was invited, and while he declined to come, he sent many gifts from himself and his wife. Most likely, he occasioned not to visit due to travel being perilous because of Ottoman activity. As for Ferenc's gift to his wife, it was an entire castle. Definitely a step above a new toaster, that is for certain, though maybe not something a 15-year-old girl would be going crazy over. While there's not much saying exactly what happened at this wedding, we can guess they played the usual wedding games for the time. One common one was all the women would wear veils, pretending to be the bride. The groom would then have to try and find his beloved in the crowd. Wealthy women in Hungary also did not have the white gown we see in our mind when we think of weddings. Ursabit would have had a very colorful dress, and, based on her wealth, it would be inset with many jewels. There's some more gossip to dispel here. There's some accounts that state that Ursabit was influenced by her mother-in-law's cruelty and sadism, and lays the blame on Lady Nadesti for whatever occurred later in Ursabit's life. 
This just doesn't hold any water at all, because by this point, both sets of parents had actually passed. The entire wedding continued by the will of other relatives, trying to make sure this alliance was solidified and taken care of. Less important to the psyche of Ursabit, but still interesting, is that she did indeed continue to sign official documents as Bathory instead of Natasty. That said, others still referred to her as Lady Natasty or, later, as the Widow Natasty. Her husband did not hyphenate, as some suggest. Still, the dynamic between this power couple was going to be very interesting to behold in the years to come. In public, Ursabit was frequently described as a model lady. She was the one that people hoped their daughters might grow up to be. She was devoutly pious, as well as quite charitable. On several occasions she personally assisted destitute individuals with her wealth and influence. And, if she was the model lady, her husband was the model lord. Early in their marriage, war broke out with the Ottoman Turks. Hungary had a call to arms, and this was what Ferenc had been preparing for his entire boyhood. He became a captain in the Hungarian army, and was widely feared by the enemy, for reasons we'll get into later. Since there was a war going on, Ferenc was away from home frequently. As he was gone so often, Ursabit was commonly in the company of her Aunt Clara. In all probability this was a woman taking a naive girl under her wing. Ursabit was still quite young and no longer had her mother to teach her etiquette. Later rumors would have it, however, that Aunt Clara was a bisexual, scandalous, for the era, as well as a witch. These accounts would suggest that Ursabit began being taught the ways of torture and witchcraft from her auntie, as well as lesbianism. Given Clara was 60 years old at the time, an extraordinary age to reach for a woman of the 1500s, she probably wasn't in the kind of shape required for sexual escapades. It may be however that she practiced herbal medicine, which was more tolerated at this time. Given over 300 servants testified at the later trial however, and none of them ever mentioned this, it's safe to say these were unfounded rumors that were written down in later accounts. As for Ferenc, when he wasn't on the battlefield, he tended to do whatever pleased him most at the time. This included running off to other countries without informing his young bride. Ursabit wrote this letter scolding her husband for his impromptu trip to Transylvania. I found out from a letter of His Majesty that you went from Vass, the county in which Castle Sarver was located, to Transylvania, and I find that very surprising, since nothing good can come from Transylvania. The same land from which we collect the harvest is also the land from which we receive bad news. All are surprised about this, because you did not take possession of any property in Transylvania. You live from the yield and fat of this country, so why did you leave this country? We do not understand this, as we have learned from the first letter of our friend, about which I wrote, who highly questions me. This has affected me very much, and when I heard it, I was very bitter. God maintain your health. Perhaps it was more the hiccups of early marriage, with neither side quite understanding the other. Although, it wouldn't be uncommon for the time for husbands to treat their wives as property that could be freely abused. That aside, Ferenc did show himself as being very caring at times, and spoke well of her to others. Once, when she fell ill, he remained behind to be by her side instead of attending a Christmas banquet. While he was gone, however, Ursabit was the exclusive boss of all their domains. Even the highest servant would yield to her orders. She was an exemplary sort of chief of staff, by all accounts. She wrote and signed documents, managed the servants, arbitrated disputes in their various holdings, and even handled some diplomatically sensitive issues. She was a very precise manager, specifying quantities of items when she sent her servants to buy them. Her correspondence, as a result, could be curt and exacting. She also oversaw the purchasing of various livestock and crops. This included pygmy cows, which are just downright adorable, if nothing else. Even more odd to the modern observer is that she actually raised hemp crops, in other words, marijuana. She even scolded one of her servants for presumably stealing some of the crop, writing several angry letters. Our thanks, after which we wish to inform you to send a mixture of fish. You are well aware that, if God's peace brings my husband back, you will have to answer and explain what you are doing, unto. Go and get more of those that you like and send them to us. 
Sir, you well know that this is the second or third letter I have sent regarding the cannabis, and there is no answer. You could not account for what was taken. I am highly angered and do not wish to take issue. Accordingly, go. Get it and send it here to Sarver. God keep you. Done at Sarver, January 23, 1589. Lady Ursabit Bathory. Although many nobles at the time used it medicinally or recreationally, it's not quite known whether Ursabit did so herself or simply grew it for sale. In many ways, things were more acceptable in this age than one might have anticipated. When Ursabit was not working, she enjoyed the usual things of a lady of high class. Going to the spa, shopping for expensive pleasures, and attending concerts in Vienna in her free time. It was truly a life of luxury, though things weren't always easy. While Ferenc returned from his wartime adventures with several looted treasures, these assets weren't something that could be liquidated quickly. As a result, the Nadastis were rich in physical items of great value, but not in actual money. This struggle would be a constant in Ursabit's mind. Perhaps just as exhausting for her was the need to prepare for every time Ferenc returned home. His arrivals always called for great pomp and circumstance. It brought the usual trumpets and feasting one might imagine for noble celebrations. For Ursabit, it was entirely stressful, and she would become very curt to the servants if anything was compromised for the festivities. Moreover, his returns often coincided with events like Easter, Christmas, and the harvest. It was easy for Ferenc to return for these, since the battlefields he reigned over were near his own holdings. The first ten years of marriage passed with this sort of routine for the Nadastis. And for these first ten years, surprisingly, no children were born from the Union. The reasons aren't entirely clear, although there's certainly plenty of theories. Most obviously, Ferenc was often away at war, which meant there wasn't quite as much opportunity for relations. Others wonder that Ferenc may have resented Ursabit's infidelity before their marriage. Possibly, one or the other may have been homosexual, or they just downright didn't like each other. As far as hating each other, however, there's no particular evidence of a bad relationship. They seem to get along well enough, with the usual marital bickering. One final possibility was that Ursabit was infertile. She certainly did engage in various herbal treatments and spas after consulting with a certain Countess Eva. Ursabit was unusual in her dislike for conventional medicine of the time, which was usually leeches and bloodletting. Funnily enough, her preferences for alternative healing was probably more effective. Whatever the reasoning, after ten years, in 1585, their first child, Anna, was born. By 1598, over a span of thirteen years, they would have five children. Three girls and the younger two sons. Only three would live to adulthood. Anna, Kata, and the young son Pal. Based on Ursabit's writings, she was a good mother, writing to her husband worrying about her children's health. One letter mentioned having to put a hot iron into the mouth of young Kata to stop rot. Dentistry definitely wasn't any more advanced than regular medicine in those days. The children of course would have been mostly taken care of by a wet nurse. In Hungary, this was called a dodgka. This woman was named Alona Jo, and that's a name that will become important later. During the time of her children's youth, Ursabit moved between various holdings of the Nadistes, while Ferenc enjoyed most being at Sarver, his boyhood home. Whenever he was home, Ursabit was there with him. However, as he was absent, she would tour the other estates. It was during these times that strange things began to happen. The first time worth mentioning was around when Ursabit's first child was born. It went a little something like this. A young serving girl dies mysteriously. The local pastor is summoned to give the final rites. When he arrives, the casket is already prepared and sealed with the body inside. The pastor would be surprised, as normally the deceased would be resting in bed. The lady would pull him to the side and whisper in his ear, explaining that the poor thing had died of cholera, and of course she doesn't want to cause a panic in town. Cholera being poorly understood at the time but outbreaks deeply feared, the pastor merely accepts the excuse, and takes the casket away. But then, the clergy is summoned again, just a short time later. Rumors circulate amongst the staff that this time, the casket has three girls nailed inside of it. 
The pastor is obviously concerned, but Ursabit explains brusquely that nay, it was only two girls, both having died also of cholera, and wouldn't it be a waste of resources to bury them separately? She tells the belfry to bury them together. The servants don't ask questions, as questions lead to trouble for them. From this point onwards, unexplained deaths would surround Ursabit Bathory, at an alarming rate. In every case, the victim would be a young woman or girl, mostly aged between 10 and 14 years old, taken to a forbidden suite of rooms, and all that remained was rumors of torture that may have taken place. Always, Ursabit kept her inner chambers under guard by the castellan. What sounds he heard were kept mum to himself until much later, when he would report before the court of the terrible things he heard going on for hours. Even this early the rumors drew unwanted attention for Ursabit. A Lutheran pastor by the name of Istvan Magyari was approached by a pair of knights working at the castle sarver. Being a prominent and principled man, they determined they could trust him. They asked him to tell the countess to stop her madness, and if she did not, to denounce her crimes from the pulpit, for, it offends the Lord God, and he will not tolerate it. Magyari took up the challenge, and while the lady was in attendance at one of his sermons, he publicly accused her. He told all and sundry that they need only exhume the body of the most recent dead girl to know the truth of the matter. Ursabit was scornful and threatened to see Magyari punished by her husband and her influential relatives. Magyari wrote with other pastors for support, some of them higher up in the church. It was here that we first see him name another woman rumored to be involved, assisting in Ursabit's brutality. They called her the executioner woman. Anna Darvolia was a Croatian woman and had been recorded as having working for the Nadesti family for some years. It was alleged this foreign lady had been the one to teach Ursabit, along with other servants, how to perform elaborate torturing techniques. Her supposed favorite was repeatedly beating a victim to death, up to 500 blows. While the letters spoke the rumor that Anna has been the perpetrator of much of the torture, however, it was indicated that not only Ursabit approved of her, but Ferenc as well. In fact, Anna is said to have taught Ferenc the Turkish strangulation-style execution he would use later. As much as his wife, Ferenc had a penchant for cruelty and brutality, and for that he did not escape criticism from others. He was known to be ruthless on the battlefield, heartless to his enemies. He would pick up the corpses of the fallen and dance with them, a scene you might associate with a certain movie about vampires. Moreover, he would often play kickball with dismembered heads. Allegedly, he came home with a device that had claws on it, to be worn on the hand for stabbing. It is definitely something that brings to mind Freddy Krueger and his ghoulish weapon of choice. Even more cruel was the report that Ferenc had the younger sister of the nursemaid Alona Joe covered in honey, and then made to stand in the sun. This attracted a multitude of bugs that began to bite and sting her all over. For Ferenc, however, his cruelty stopped short of murder. That was because, to him, image was absolutely everything. He was Ferenc Nadesti, the hero of the kingdom, after all. People idolized him, and by proxy, admired his wife. And so, in a private conversation, he told Ursabit she needed to behave herself. At least, in so far as killing servant girls went, that was where he drew the line. That said, there was no denying his cruelty towards others had an influence on Ursabit along with that of the butcher woman Anna. Before them, Ursabit had been confined to smaller acts of torment such as pinching, kicking, and biting. Then, she was escalating to placing pins in the lips and under the nails. And then later, burning and attacking with knives. Her volatile emotions and bouts of violence were never entirely discouraged by her husband, and obviously were only enhanced by her violent companions. But now, Ursabit was in trouble the church had publicly accused her, after all. People were talking. On Ference's return from the warfront, he was understandably very upset with how things had turned out. Whether he brought punishment to his wife is unknown, but his behavior to the church was certainly more honey than vinegar. He donated exuberantly to the church and schmoozed them, until they were appeased enough to drop the matter. Even the talk of excommunication surrounding the servant Anna disappeared as the coins piled up. Soon after, Ferenc made up as well with the priest Magyari, who had instigated the whole affair. Later in life, Magyari would even defend Ferenc passionately when others questioned if Ferenc was worthy of ascending to heaven. 
The reality of things was that Ferenc was just too rich and powerful to be punished. Not only was he a war hero known throughout the country, but the Hungarian king was in massive debt to him, owing him 18,000 gulden. This would at least be 1.5 million US dollars in today's money, although the rate of exchange isn't exact for these kinds of things. Either way, with the Nadastis bankrolling Hungary and the Habsburgs, they were basically untouchable. Untouchable by human hands, that is. Because in 1601, Ferenc became mysteriously ill, complaining of a pain in his legs that was strong enough he was unable to stand. In a few weeks, he managed to get back to work, but the condition persisted for him for the next two years. At that time, he fell very ill once more, but this time, he was permanently disabled, unable to rise from his bed. Whatever was ailing him is unknown to this day, but it was apparent that he was nearing his end, and so Ferenc decided to prepare quickly for his inevitable demise. He sent a letter to another man named Ferenc, Ferenc Bathiana, an old friend of his. He begged Bathiana to protect his family, who would be vulnerable when he was gone, not only to the dark rumors but to the vultures that would be circling the Nadesti fortune on his passing. He sent another letter to Georgi Thurzo, who would later play a large role in Ursabit's life. He asked Thurzo to also protect his widow and his children. The wish of a dying man weighed heavily on the honor of course, and this was what Ferenc intended on sending the letter to Thurzo. Thurzo was another of the most powerful men in the country, and his protection, or, at least, his lack of interference, would be a shrewd move for protecting his family. In January of 1604, Ferenc Nadesti, the Black Knight of Hungary, passed away. He was buried with all the pomp that accompanied him in his life. The priest that had caused so much trouble for Ursabit, Magyari, gave the sermon at the funeral. He had only strong words of praise for Ferenc, describing him as humble and caring for the poor. It seems this may have been Magyari's true feelings, given how fervently he would defend Ferenc even long after the latter had passed and his coffers were no longer funding the church. The funeral was unusually fast for the age. Normally, when a member of a family had passed away, the body was left out for months so that relatives could make arrangements to travel to the funeral and say farewell one last time. Ursabit was very quick to bury her husband, so that within four weeks she was in Vienna again making business arrangements. Eight months later, Ursabit would go on a massive shopping spree, spending 2942 gold and 11 denar. To compare, a high-ranking officer in the military at the time would make 150 silver annually. Ursabit was spending millions in modern money, but so rich was she at the time, that she paid off her debt within a single month. Throughout it all she continued to run the business affairs of her husband, taking care of all the details of the Nadesti estate, including charitable works and even protecting the Protestant clergy from predatory Catholic nobles. The time of religious turmoil was quickly approaching, but Ursabit kept up a very saintly public image, the type of woman that other noble ladies advised their daughters to emulate in their everyday lives. Privately, however, Ursabit continued to deteriorate, as the bodies piled up. A rebellion from Transylvania broke out around this time. The Habsburgs had installed a new Catholic king on the throne, and they were determined to stamp out the Protestants and Turks alike. Even Protestant nobles were being seized and held hostage. This led to a reactionary rebellion erupting, led by a Protestant noble from Hungary. Amidst the turmoil, Erzabet's eldest daughter Anna was being married. Her husband had declared for this rebellion, after safely moving his new bride to Austria. Ursabit was deeply troubled herself with the decision of where to place her own loyalties. The rebels, though Protestant like herself, were nasty looters, and picked apart properties indiscriminately no matter which side you stood on. As for the Habsburg, they were Catholic and unpleasant, not to mention dangerous, but they were also backing the king which meant even greater political danger if going against them. On the advice of family friend Ferenc Bathiani, Ursabit decided to remain loyal to the crown, with some difficulty. Other nobles were much more tenuous than herself, and she expressed in letters to Bathiani her worries on their eventual turning. Ultimately she was forced to walk a political tightrope between divided interests. Many of her own townspeople were Catholic, and in an effort to ease relations, Ursabit even found herself housing the new pope on her estates as he performed a tour hoping to rally the common folk against the Turks. Even her relationship with Bathiani was not always good. 
As he became the Lord General, his own troops ravaged and sacked the Nadasti lands, which would lead to reparations that would last for several decades. Bathiani even sent a servant to her doorstep, claiming she agreed to sponsor mercenaries for the war and that payment was due for them. Ursabit wrote in response the following. This envoy gave word that the pawns, i.e., foot soldiers, had been sponsored by me, although I myself had not given them, such that it would now be necessary for me to act if accepted. But see that, by God, I have nothing and cannot pay for it, if accepted. She managed to avoid payment, luckily for her, as her financial state had begun to deteriorate badly without her husband's income from pillaging and looting. In July of 1605, Ursabit's brother passed away, and she had to hastily make arrangements for his funeral. With the strain of war, and her husband and brother passing within a year of each other, the pressure piled onto her shoulders, and Ursabit Bathory seemed to snap mentally. While in the carriage on the way to the funeral, witnesses state that she assaulted the handmaids riding in the carriage with her. Three of them were so badly injured they succumbed to their wounds and were buried on the road. These weren't merely peasant girls either, that had died. One of them was the daughter of a nobleman. The death toll rose, with a brief respite when she took refuge with her daughter and son-in-law to escape some of the fighting. The next year, in 1606, she managed to return to her estate at Sarver. It seemed her troubles were at no end as even her family gave her no respite. A cousin was occupying an estate of hers out of desperation from the rampant poverty that correlated with the war. Ursabit sent off a harsh letter scolding and threatening her cousin, and adding this rather ominous postscript. I know well, Lord Banfi, that this is only the new poverty, that you would be watching my small estate and do this. Not for the wealth, but yet know you this, that I will not allow myself to be dominated by men for long. The threat would be enough for her cousin to retreat, but she would continue to be plagued by her predator relatives. At least, the year brought the end of the war with an uneasy peace. Religious rights were even granted, and most of the rebels were pardoned. Yet the desperation for money was not gone. Ursabit made many trips to court personally to demand that the king repay the debts he owed to her husband. Of course, the answer was no every time, despite her persistence. In fact, Ursabit would never see that money, but ironically paid taxes to the king every year. In an effort to raise funds, she began selling properties for coin and even absconded a few castles for poor pay in return. The stress of financial troubles and social duties continued to fuel Ursabit's outbursts of rage. While traveling to a wedding she would rather have missed, a servant girl fled from one of Ursabit's cruel attacks. She was found and dragged back for punishment. Her sentence from her mistress was to be stripped naked and submerged to the neck in a nearby body of water, in the middle of the bitter winter cold. She was doused repeatedly until she froze to death. At around 1608, Ursabit did receive the reparations asked for from Ferenc Bathiany for the sacking of her lands. She proceeded to petition for other nobles to be granted financial relief as well. She was still quite welcome in these noble circles, and was invited to large events regularly. Including, in this year, the coronation of King Matyas as the King of Hungary and Croatia. As was normal with public appearances, she took out her distress on some attendants. The records show on the journey home she burned several of them with molten iron, torturing them nearly to death. They were then sent to the estate at Kirster, where some died shortly after. And yet, bizarrely, her private rages continued to contrast with her public behavior. She was known for protecting others who were helpless. One example around this time involved an old woman in the town of Tokorks. The woman in question had had her home vandalized and property stolen several times, including by her own servants. She petitioned the Lady Bathory for aid, and Ursabit forwarded the case to the sheriff of the county, requesting that the ones who are at fault should be punished. The irony seemed to pass her by. Now, while we've talked briefly about one of Ursabit's main accomplices, the butcher woman Anna, there were in fact several more key assistants to her deviance. They were known as Fixgo, a young man's servant, Alona Joe, the wet nurse mentioned earlier, Dorat Yacentis, a friend of Alona Joe's, and Cataline, a washerwoman who worked on the estates. We'll touch briefly on each one, and how they came to be a part of Ursabit's estate. Janos Fixgo Ujeri, aka Fixgo, 
was brought to the Natasty's service sometime between 1590 and 1595, likely by brute force. He was still very young by this point in our story, the year 1609. During the later trial, he was not yet considered an adult. In Hungary, adulthood was not considered in a criminal conviction until age 25. Most likely, Fixko was still under the age of 20. He was also rumored by some to be disfigured, and was known for being boastful, even about those he murdered. And yet, the Countess never reprimanded him for his loose tongue. Alona Jo Nagy was, as mentioned, the wet nurse for Ursabit's children. Once Pal had become old enough to manage on his own, Alona Jo was moved to the manor home at Sejthi. She was an older woman now, no longer able to nurse children, but Ursabit cared for the lady in her retirement since she had been a wet nurse for the family for decades. Despite what one would assume as a maternal bent given her profession, Alona Jo was documented as one of the most cruel of the accomplices. Doratya Sentis was a later addition to the house, only entering it in 1605. She was a friend of Alona Jo's, and was promised work through that connection. Later, Doratya would claim Alona Jo tricked her into serving the Lady Bathory by being told she'd be working for the daughter Cataline instead. And finally, Cataline Benecki, who arrived on the scene in 1600. She was a washerwoman by trade, and had been invited to the castle by the same priest who would later attempt to excommunicate Anna. Cataline was the most pitiful of the crew, and seemed to dislike violence. With Anna and Ursabit as the leaders of this crew, they accomplished a shocking amount of cruelty over the years. As an aside, only a single portrait of Ursabit's remains to this day, from when she was age 25, a few years after the murders first began. Likely, any other images of her were destroyed later by the family out of shame. The one picture we have shows a pale woman with a high forehead and dark hair. Women at the time actually plucked their hairline to make the forehead appear higher. As for her beautiful skin, the legend went that Ursabit learned of using blood as a skin cream after striking a servant hard enough to spatter blood on her own cheeks. Apparently baths worked quite well for keeping her youthful, but as she aged, peasant blood had less and less of an effect. It would seem she would need noble blood to continue her work, or so a witch advised her. But, from all trial accounts, there was never any mention of bathing in blood. In the 1720s, far after the events, a Jesuit priest would take accounts from the local villagers who relayed this story. From this record, other documents and books would be written from the rumors, expanding into the current legend of Ursabit Bathory. There was also no mention either of attempting to retain blood from the victims for any purpose, though supposedly after severe torture it would pool enough on the ground to scoop up by the handful. The vampiric legends that also sprang up may have come from Ursabit biting her victims in her fits of rage. Unfortunately for her, one of her strongest accomplices was soon to pass, Anna suffered a blinding stroke in 1609 that eventually killed her. After Anna's death, Ursabit found a friend in a woman named Ertzi Majorova, a forest witch, who was appointed as Lady Steward. It was rare she appeared however, except to perform the secret rituals that Ursabit seemed to be entranced by. It was Ertzi who is said to suggest Ursabit begin using noble blood, while Ertzi supplied her mistress with potions, spells, and magical cakes. Of course, if we consider a less magical explanation for Ursabit pivoting to this new pool of prey, the fact of the matter was among the serving class the stories had spread far and wide now. Any decent parent would shelter their daughters from being a potential victim, even turning down offers with good wages or promises of marriage. Ursabit's assistants had to wander further to find new victims, as well as coerce the locals to assist in their quest. In fact, later trial testimony would show that commoners and nobles alike helped in procuring girls. The list had nearly 20 notable names on it. Thus, given the difficulties of finding good help those days, Ursabit had a new idea to get access to noble girls. In the winter of 1609, she opened up an academy of etiquette, called a gynoseum which is Greek for women's residence. Ursabit's respectability and social standing enticed nobles to send their daughters for instruction, for a hefty fee of course. In that way she managed to not only secure more victims, but also help bring in income to address her monetary problems. Of course, it wasn't long before girls went missing, or admission to see them was mysteriously denied. One nobleman, Janos Belanski, came by to see his sister and refused to leave until he saw her. 
she was brought out in a weakened state, barely able to hold out her hands, and wept bitterly. Mysteriously, and horrifically, Janos left her there, and she subsequently was tortured to death. There is no further record or investigation than the testimony given on these events. The castellan at the gynoseum noted that seven girls had been buried in the garden behind the courtyard. They had not been buried well or deep enough, as the bodies were dug up by dogs and they could be seen with pieces of corpses in their jaws. Even Ursabit's own trusted staff weren't exempt. Her courtmaster was a man named Benedict de Seo, and he was the unfortunate soul who had to stand guard outside her torture chambers while the lady was at work. His niece ended up interred in the gynoseum. When the countess was on her way to Sejthi, she had the girl with her, and de Seo attempted to see her. He pleaded with Ursabit to not take her, already seeing his niece in a pitiful state as she boarded the coach. Coldly, Ursabit stated that the girl had attempted to escape three times already and all the more she would kill her for it. His niece was taken, and Deseo never saw her again, as she was beaten to death inside the walls of Sejthi. By that point, decades into her cruel games, Ursabit was getting sloppy. Girls were obviously being harmed, with terrible injuries being spotted in public. Several accounts arose now of people seeing girls with burns, bruises, and scratches. One particularly egregious slip had a tortured servant girl escape to town with a knife still buried in her foot. Nonetheless, in a matter of weeks, the finishing school was entirely wiped out. Ursabit claimed one of the boarding girls murdered the rest out of greed for jewelry, and then committed suicide when the servants discovered her. Her excuses didn't stop nearly a dozen complaints from families of the king and palatine courts from accusing the countess of foul crimes however. The king now had the information he needed to seek criminal charges against Ursabit Bathory. For the most part, it was the priesthood that raised physical evidence. One elderly priest kept records of every girl buried by himself over the years. On one single night he recorded burying nine young girls, dead of mysterious causes. His successor, a young man named Reverend Ponikinus, investigated tunnels connecting the church and castle. Normally, the family had wine and ottoman loot kept there, but on his investigation, he found boxes filled with rotting corpses. The reverend wrote to a superior with his findings, but his letter was intercepted. Fearing for life, Ponikinus attempted to flee quickly from the estate, but was caught by the castle staff on his way out. They gave him a dark warning, but he was thankfully not harmed. Ponikinus plotted quietly, and eventually succeeded in getting evidence sent out past the staff, and it made it to the king and the palatine. The king ordered his palatine to investigate, and the man in question is not so unfamiliar to the Nadesti family. The man was Georgi Thurzo, the very person that Ferenc Nadesti wrote a letter to on his deathbed, asking Thurzo to be a guardian to his wife and children. Naturally, this put Georgi Thurzo in a very awkward position as far as his honor was concerned. In those days in Hungary, it would take an act of parliament to charge the countess with her crimes. Thurzo likely hoped to appease the king during the delays, as he planned initially to put countess in a convent instead of imprisoning or executing her. The king had interest in securing a criminal conviction, however, in order to seize Ursabit's land and erase any debt to the Nadastis still looming. Certainly, it would relieve him of several problems at once. Some writers paint Thurzo as a betrayer to the family. However, he did not gain anything personally from this situation, and indeed he usually helped Ursabit to prevent confiscation of her lands by greedy relatives. There is evidence of some relatives of Ursabit's attempting to bribe him however. Others claim he had a secret romance with her, though this is not fully demonstrated either. While he worked to spare her of death, Thurzo did claim to have seen the lady torturing others and publicly declared she did not deserve to breathe air or to see light at a later date. As Thurzo was planning his next moves, it was the beginning of 1610, and Ursabit was seeing her daughter Cotiline married to Georgie Drujith de Homine. Naturally, rumors swirled around the woman, and it was whispered they tortured two girls to death together, with the bodies being buried on the night of the festivities. The next month, Thurzo sent two investigators to begin collections of witnesses to the suspected crimes and they came from all walks of life. To encourage honesty even against the fear for their lives and livelihoods, there was a heavy fine for anyone caught lying to the investigation. 
Unfortunately, the initial investigation only had inconclusive rumors as they were interviewing only those off the estate. Those outside the castle only had rumors, while those inside were too fearful to speak in more than speculation. The most they got was one witness saying he knew 175 dead girls taken out, but he could not say he saw torturing or killing personally. As a bit of a break for him, Thurzo was approached by Ursabit's two sons-in-law, whom asked how they might keep the scandal from exploding out of control. Thurzo acquired their loyalty as he made his plan. It was surprisingly easy, as both men were obviously greedy. Amusingly, they each wrote to Thurzo to protest that they should receive equal share of the property once their mother-in-law was gone. With such a large-scale operation, keeping things discreet didn't last for long. Ursabit learned of the investigation soon enough. Once she did, she went directly to the court of Eisenberg, bringing along with her a mother of one of the dead girls. She had this woman testify that her daughter died of natural causes. Of course, it's most likely the mother was paid to say these things, but possibly this particular case could have been true. There's no record of the court's reaction to the testimony. In fact, it was not even written in a formal account of the judicial system. Not stopping there, Ursabit desperately wrote around to everyone she knew, asking about the investigators and how they were received by the witnesses they interviewed. Leaving to another estate, in September 1610 she then wrote her last will and testament, which perhaps gave signal to her state of mind as to how things were about to go for her. All of her assets would be divided equally among her children, which created less of a financial target against her back for her potential enemies. If she were gone, then her wealth would not be easy to collect in the ashes. Then, she took all her jewels and set up at Sejthi Castle as the end neared. Ursabit sought legal advice from her advisors, though the servants begged her to stop as she was going to be inevitably arrested for her sins. The countess replied arrogantly that she was above arrest. Despite that, however, she continued to arrange her legal affairs and appointed a proctor for her estate. The tension rose between Thurzo and the Countess, to the point where even their servants were attacking each other. One of Thurzo's men got into a fight after being drunk, and, after the fight broke up, he injured the Countess' servant's horse. The two then dueled, but one ended up breaking his sword and then the other fled. The Countess wrote to complain to Thurzo about the incident, but there was little to do other than keep their servants in check. Sometime before Christmas, Thurzo went to Sejthi to meet with Ursabit personally. He informed her of the accusations against her and wanted to know about the dead girls and the denouncements. Calmly and charmingly, Ursabit served him tea and cakes and told him it was all just nonsense. The girls died of the epidemic and were buried quickly to avoid panic and that was all. With her perfect social mask, she managed to delay the inevitable as Thurzo left without an arrest or sending her to the convent. Immediately afterward, more girls died, as the stress for the Lady Bathory rose. Her accomplices also became more careless, as it was growing harder to dispose of bodies. Fixo later recounted that five bodies were tossed into a pit, and two into the water canal, where they might easily be found by passers-by. Doratya and Cataline related hiding bodies under beds, or in storage areas. Once Cataline dragged a body through a courtyard with onlookers blatantly observing the event, and doing nothing to stop it. After this incident and after Thurzo's visit, the servants decided to merely drop the bodies over the castle walls, hoping the wolves would eat the carcasses. Instead, of course, the local villagers found the macabre scene and reported it to the authorities. On Christmas Eve, several clergymen visited the estate to ask the countess to repent. They informed her that Thurzo and even King Matthias himself would also be coming. Ursabit found the clergy merely annoying, but King and Thurzo were terrifying prospects. She summoned her forest witch friend Ertzi Majorova for help, requesting to be made invisible from attackers. The two women made a special cake with a communion wafer in the middle and chanted over it for an hour, in order to render the countess invisible. Two more cakes were then made with a special ingredients to be served after dinner for their guests. Fisco and other witnesses guessed the cakes were made to poison the men who would determine Ursabit's fate. All the guests of the evening visit became ill after eating. The king and Palatine suspected much the same as Fisco, that it was an attempt on their lives. Immediately after the dinner, charges were filed against the countess for murder. 
any hope of sending her away to a convent quietly was gone. On December 27, 1610, Thurzo, Ursabit's sons-in-law, two counts, her son's tutor, and an armed escort set out to arrest her. Letters from Thurzo's wife right at this time suggest there was still some uncertainty as to if Ursabit had actually committed these acts, or was a victim of vicious rumor. Shortly before the men arrived to arrest her, the countess's evening was spent with the forest witch to engage in magic. They brought along a scribe, who wrote down this utterance, after being told he would be killed if he omitted anything. Help, oh help, you clouds. Help, clouds, give health, give Ursabit Bathory health. Send, oh, send forth, you clouds, ninety cats. I command you, leader of the cats, that you hear my command and assemble them together, from wherever they may be, whether they are on the other side of the mountain, beyond the water, beyond the sea, that these ninety cats come to you and, from you, should go straight into the heart of King Matthias and also the heart of the Palatine. In the same way should they chew to pieces the heart of the Red Megari and the heart of Moses Ziriki, so that Ursabit Bathory shall not suffer any grief. Holy Trinity, so it is done. Ursabit's son would write later of the night of her capture only a single line in his Chronicle of the Castle. Lady Ursabit Bathory was captured during dinner and next day brought into the castle. The procession entered late at night with many people watching, having waited a long time for this. The investigators went straight to the keep to look for any bodies. According to Thurzo's writings, when the men entered, they found these bodies of dead or dying girls everywhere. One corpse was found right in front of Ursabit, who watched as a coat was placed over the dead girl and the unfortunate soul was carried away. Ursabit was taken soon after, while the bodies were inspected. The men observed burns and flesh torn out with pliers on some. One girl's wounds were so deep a fist could easily be stuck through them. For the survivors, one was found with her right hand and arm mangled, the flesh gouged out. She stated that the servant Cataline cut her, while the lady beat her with her hand. Another was an old woman who was found bound. It was no doubt surprising, since obviously the lady preferred her victims to be young girls. The woman stated she had been captured after refusing to give her daughter over to the countess. Ursabit gave her formal statement, which was that she was innocent, and any wrongdoing was the actions of her servants. She was kept in imprisonment in Castle Sejthi, while her accomplices were taken and caged at Bitka Castle. As was the norm of the time, they were then tortured into confessions. Ursabit herself was held in the very dungeon where her victims had been brought forth from the night before. The Reverend Ponikinus, the one who had smuggled out letters stating what he'd seen, visited Ursabit along with some other priests, to comfort her. This was so she would not fall into temptation, a discreet code for committing suicide. However, on his arrival, the Countess was enraged. She told them it was their fault she was here, which wasn't quite so incorrect. She made threats to the men, and stated that her relatives would avenge the wrongs brought against her. Despite her imprisonment, she was in fact able to summon servants and write letters, which she did so before the priest's very eyes. After much arguing with them over her innocence, she declared it was the old woman, i.e., Anna the Butcher, who did all the horrible things. Of course, that didn't quite account for the fresh horrors witnessed on her arrest. One priest asked why she allowed her servants to behave this way, if they indeed were the real culprits. Her answer surprised them, because even I myself was afraid of them. After being tortured, Ursabit's servants were made to give testimony. The torture method for the prisoners is unknown. Fixco was the first to give testimony. He stated that he and Doratya went out on six occasions to acquire girls. Many children were given up from their homes for a finder's fee. Even mothers sold their daughters, knowing what would happen once they were in the countess's walls. He noted the other women accomplices brought in more too, except for Cataline, who he stated only buried the dead. Fixco's estimate of the body count was 36. He related how girls were tortured, stating Alona Jo was cruel with pins, and would tear girls' mouths with her fingers to starve them. There was always an excuse to harm them, for not doing their work well, petty theft, running away, complaining, and so on. The old woman, Anna, hid and buried most girls, according to him, though he did admit to helping with eight bodies. The servants were often given gifts when Anna killed someone. As for Ursabit, 
he stated she tortured them by locking girls naked in the coal shed. Fixco claimed that many knew of the deeds, including Benedict Deseo who guarded the private chambers, though Benedict never spoke of it. He also claimed there was a man called Iron-Headed Stefan who was close to Ursabit but no longer in her service. It may be Fixco was inventing this person or passing blame, as no one else mentioned him in their testimony. Fixco confirmed that Ursabit tortured girls even while the Lord was still alive, and that Ferenc Nadezi knew of it. But, she only became murderous with Anna's help. He related the poisoning attempt as well, and how it was botched. Ilona Jo was next. She stated 50 or so girls had been murdered, but didn't know where they all came from, aside from a few, including those she brought. She also blamed Anna for being convinced to murder and harm the servants, but elaborated quickly on Ursabit's beatings, burnings, and stabbings. After Anna went blind from her stroke, Alona Jo, Cataline, and Doratya began to beat the girls for her. She stated she was not involved in burials. Everywhere they went from estate to estate, Alona said the Countess wanted more girls brought in. She also mentioned a man named Kozma who knew of the violence happening behind closed doors. It is possible he is related to the Iron Head Stefan that Fixco mentioned, but no one knows for sure. Doratya, or Dorka as her companions knew her, was next. She also said she didn't know where the girls came from, and claimed if she did not torture them the lady would do it herself if Doratya did not. She also accused Cataline of locking girls away, though admitted herself to harming them often. She even stated she would bring some of them to the lady when Ursabit was ill, so she could tear their flesh with her teeth from her bed. Doratya stated firmly that the countess made them do, not the other way around. Elsewise, much of her testimony was the same as Fisco. Cataline was the last one to be brought to give a statement. She was by her own testimony and others, the least involved in procurement, having not done any and knowing not at all any of the girls who were taken. Doratya brought the most girls, and all of those ones died. Cataline stated Alona Jo would scream at her to keep beating people though she did not wish to, and was forced to continue until too tired to attack. She also said Alona was favored by the Countess, and was given dresses for her daughters. Doratya would also beat Cataline if she refused to harm others, once going so far that Cataline was bedridden for an entire month from her injuries. She claimed, as the others, it was Anna who taught her to torture. After the confessions were recorded, a second judicial proceeding began, with reading of the confessions and then a calling of eyewitness testimony. The witnesses included those who performed the arrest, who were called to give account of the corpses found on entry to the castle. Most were also citizens of the estate. Near the end of the proceeding, a young girl named Susanna was called, who gave a shocking twist of testimony. While the victims at Sejthi were given at 50 and those at Sarver 175 by the accomplices, Susanna claimed a staggering 650 were killed, based on a log that Ursabit kept which she claimed she'd seen in the Countess's possessions. She also claimed a steward named Jacob Silvesi had discovered written proof. Jacob was never called to stand and when questioned a year later, the man was not asked about it. Based on later comments by King and Court, it's likely Susanna wasn't taken seriously, and the whole thing was done as a show to shock the common observer. A few more witnesses were called after the young lady, all of them giving similar testimony on the atrocities. The final witness, a woman named Anna Gionxi, ended the trial by relating that she was not allowed to see her 10-year-old daughter, who became a victim. The decision was reached by 18 tribunals after the final witness, and the sentence was read and judgment carried out immediately. Alona Jo and Doratya were deemed the worst offenders. As a result, they received the harshest sentences. They were to have the fingers on both hands torn out, and then would be executed and burned. For Fixgo, given his young age, he was given leniency. Leniency meant that he would be beheaded immediately and then burned with the other two. As for Cataline, the evidence against her was inconclusive, so they deemed to keep her further imprisoned until more details could be gathered. The executions were carried out the very same day, with a great pyre built, and an executioner standing there heating his axe and tongs. With the tongs, he started with Alona Joe, and ripped off Alona's fingers one by one. Screams came not only from Doratya, but the crowd that came to watch the public torture. 
Reportedly Alona Joe fainted after the fourth digit and was thus given a merciful fatal blow and thrown onto pyre. Doratya had also fainted out of fright, but she was roused and also had two of her fingers removed before being burned. Fixko went quickly in comparison, his head removed and summarily thrown to flame. A gibbet was raised to show justice had been done. A few weeks later, Ursi Majorova, the so-called mistress of Miava, Ursabit's witch companion, was tried, condemned, and burned at the stake for witchcraft. No further record remains of Cataline's fate, or of further evidence against her being found. It is likely she died in prison or was released discreetly, to live the rest of her life in anonymity. With her servants so quickly dispatched from the world, the attention returned to Lady Ursabit Bathory. For Ursabit, the king's representative wanted the lady interrogated, in other words, tortured for a confession. Thurzo refused, wanting to protect the Nadesti family name despite her crimes. He insisted the proceedings be done in secret, not like the public display that occurred for the accomplices. This move was unprecedented and risky, perplexing even given his recent push to punish the lady. He was claiming full power over proceedings. Perhaps he still doubted if Ursabit had personally done the accused crimes, something he'd already wondered to his wife in letters. But even so, under respondeat superior, meaning, let the master answer, she was considered responsible for her servant's actions. Thurzo and Ursabit corresponded during this time. She maintained her innocence, and accused him of not protecting her honor as he'd sworn to do. She repeatedly requested to appear in court to defend herself, which Thurzo denied every time. The priests who had spoken with Ursabit earlier, warned Thurzo of her threats to be avenged by her cousin. The said cousin, Gabor Bathory, was already throwing in with the rebellion against the king. That meant he was already arming his men, though it was not likely it was for a rescue of his imperiled cousin. Even so, he'd been funded by Ursabit for many years, which perhaps meant he owed her something. Ursabit was under house arrest, but still had servants and was kept informed of events beyond her walls. Eventually, Thurzo went to see her for a final confrontation, already displeased with the threats she'd been throwing around. After a great deal of arguing, in front of her relatives, Thurzo lost his temper, and shockingly pronounced sentence immediately. You, Erzhebet, are like a wild animal. You are in the last months of your life. You do not deserve to breathe the air on earth or see the light of the Lord. You shall disappear from this world and shall never reappear in it again. As the shadows envelop you, may you find time to repent your bestial life. I hereby condemn you, Lady of Chaith, to lifelong imprisonment in your own castle." This declaration was perhaps a bit premature, as King Matyas did not want to lose the chance at getting his fair share of the pie. His representative insisted on a judicial hearing directly against Ursabit. The king sent orders for a president of legal counsel to oversee the lady's interrogation, clashing directly with Thurzo's proclamation. There was a background of Catholic versus Protestant to consider as well. The Thirty Years' War was only a few years off, and the tension was escalating. The Catholic king Matthias wanted to claim as many Protestant holdings as possible, in order to ally with the Habsburgs. Thurzo and the Nadistes were both Protestants whose property was seriously at risk if the precedent of seizure began. Many nobles also wrote to the king, protesting an interrogation, as it would mean torture, which was disgraceful and alarming for the wealthy folk to think might be used against them. Surely, they were protected by their status from that sort of atrocity? Grateful for his aid, the Nadisti family wrote to Thurzo to thank him. Even 13-year-old Pal wrote, likely with influence from his tutor McGarry. He mentioned solemnly that the king would gain nothing by killing his mother, as her property was already divided amongst the children in her will. It is quite likely that Thurzo didn't know a will existed up until this point, which would be helpful in swaying the king's opinion. He wrote to the king stating that he believed he acted in good faith in his decision of imprisonment. Two judges wrote as well to advise the king of reasons to not proceed, it is quite likely that Thurzo didn't know a will existed up until this point, which would be helpful in swaying the king's opinion. He wrote to the king stating that he believed he acted in good faith in his decision of imprisonment. Two judges wrote as well to advise the king of reasons to not proceed. 1. It would be difficult to prove Ursabit killed the girls in a premeditated way. 
2. By law, the crown was only entitled to one-third of the beheaded's estate. And 3. In simple murders, aka the murder of commoners, they themselves had to come forward to accuse Ursabit, and the prosecutor could not seek justice on their behalf. This was unlikely since all of the commoners feared her deeply. Like other nobles, the judges concluded by pointing out the importance of her family's contributions. King Matyas was outraged by it all, and reopened the case by fiat. New investigations were now headed by the notary Andres of Carester. More witnesses were called and questioned. 224 people in Ursabit's holdings gave testimony and some of it was shocking. Ferenc Nadesti was being implicated also as a brutalizer who taught the others how to torture. Various officials were accused of being involved in turning a blind eye or themselves procuring girls. Family members of the Nadastis and Bathories found themselves under suspicion. The depth of it seemed to shake the king, who especially did not want a war hero slandered. He called more witnesses to try and refute the claims, including Benedict de Seo, Ursabit's trusted guard. But they only confirmed it, and Benedict gave terrible testimony regarding some of the torture that took place, including hands being burned by candles until black and pokers being heated and shoved into orifices. The king finally conceded to Thurzo, in order to maintain the illusion of heroism surrounding Ferenc Nadesti. Thurzo thus brokered a new deal, not only would Ursabit be imprisoned, but all the king's debts would be cancelled, he would gain a small parcel of her land, and Ursabit would be entirely erased from public record. All legal documents would be sealed, and by order of parliament, it was forbidden to speak her name. It was so carried out, and the Nadesti and Bathory names were kept safe. For Ursabit, her sentence meant total isolation in her castle, specifically in the tower. Stonemasons arrived and, brick by brick, walled the countess inside, alone. Only a small gap was left in the stonework, in order to pass supplies, food, and remove excrement. In the early months at least, visitors came, including Thurzo's wife. Unfortunately, his wife was there more to steal from Ursabit's coffers than to offer any sort of solace to the prisoner. The thieving got so rampant that a chief justice wrote to Thurzo to have him stop her pilfering. While confined, Ursabit wrote letters asking for assistance, as her daughter brought her pen and paper. However, the letters were left unanswered, her pleas of innocence falling on deaf ears. It was rumored that as paper ran out, she wrote on walls instead. Already in her fifties, she had lived longer than most, and this was a poor way to exist. Most likely she lost all lavishness, left only with her guards, common food, and having to maintain her own dressing and hygiene. She lived only two and a half years in confinement. Three weeks before her death, Ursabit summoned two priests to notarize an addendum to her will. It was to emphasize that her son-in-law, Georgie, would receive nothing from her, and only her daughter would inherit anything. Sadly for her, the attempts to prevent his possession were in vain, as no more than three weeks later, right before her death, Pal gave her son-in-law one-third of the dominion of Sejthi and Bekoff. On the day she died, Ursabit claimed her hands had gone cold to her guard. He told her to lay down, and so she did, and she sang in her empty cell. She died that evening. She was buried at the church of Sejthi, but apparently locals complained of her being put into holy ground, and she was subsequently removed to the Bathory estate. However, where she lies today is unknown, as the tomb was later opened and found empty. Thank you all very much for listening to the story of Ursabit Bathory. I know it was long and disturbing, but hopefully it was gripping and educational. She was definitely an unusual woman who was unfortunately given too much power and protection throughout her life. It's rare for any serial killer to be so prolific, let alone a female one, and her story almost feels like a fairy tale about a wicked queen in a way, perhaps due to how long ago it occurred. If you're still here, thank you again. If you have any questions or thoughts, I'd love to hear them in the comments below. If you'd like to hear more stories like this, or see more of my goofy artwork, or maybe both, please do like and subscribe to this channel. You can also see more of my artwork posted on my Instagram. I hope you all have a very scary day.